It's really hot out there. It's very hot. In fact, I'm told that this is the hottest that it has ever been in Oxford today or yesterday. Somebody said, somebody who is in this room. Anyway, uh, whether that's true or not, it is uh, the fact that things are getting really hot out there. And uh, one hot day does not make a climate change, but many hot days and uh, 16 years out of this century, out of the 17 years of this century, which have also been the hottest, when you put all that together uh, and put that together with the models we've been working on, then we know we're in trouble. So uh, I'm not going to talk much about the, the climate change as such. Uh, what I'd like to do is to share with you a few thoughts, very much along the lines of uh, uh, what was in the invitation, is to talk a little bit about climate policy at the global level and, uh, uh, and then turn into some new technologies that some people are talking about geoengineering and see what place, if any, that has and how we might need to move forward with those technologies. And then at the end I say a few words about the initiative that I am uh, responsible for in the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs, <laughs> uh, the Carnegie Climate Geoengineering Governance Initiative, uh, just to show you how we're going to solve all those problems uh, in the next two, three years. Okay, so um, first uh, to talk a little bit about climate change, so uh, at the global level, uh, and the question I'd like to pose and then try to answer it my own way is, are we on track? Are we on the right track to actually solve climate change? Is the climate ethos uh, there? Is it there and are we going to be able to fix this problem? So first, uh, just to look at very briefly uh, the geopolitical, uh, the political level. Uh, going back a few years in Paris, uh, I think it, it has to be said again, it was phenomenal to see the 155 heads of state come together on that first day. And every one of them said climate change was important and we needed a good agreement. And in fact, during that 10 days, the next 10 days, the negotiators did come up with a good agreement. Now, What's significant is that that political uh, momentum that was there continued thereafter and uh, many of these countries went home, many of these leaders went home and they ratified the agreement so much so that the Paris Agreement entered into force in a year, less than a year, phenomenal. No other international agreement of that nature has ever entered into force so fast. So that just showed the continued uh, political momentum. And then, if you look at what happened just uh, 10 days ago, I suppose, when President Trump made the announcement of his intention to move out of the Paris Agreement, and I'll come back to that later, but what was again phenomenal is to see almost total uh, unanimous support for the Paris Agreement from global leaders everywhere. So I think that's pretty good and I think we need to say that, that, that at that level the political momentum has been there and it continues to be there. Uh, but there is a little bit of a but <laughs> and uh, I think part of the but is that these same leaders, uh, yes they have ratified the agreement but they have not all gone back to their countries and set up the laws and regulations and the procedures that we need in place so that we can actually go ahead with those massive uh, reduction on emissions that we need. So there is still some way to go, but at least the direction is right. Also, many of the actions that countries are doing are not necessarily related to climate change, but they of course have an impact on climate change. But that's okay. I, I don't mind if, if people do things that are because of local air pollution or because the renewable energy prices have come down anyway. Doesn't matter as long as it does help the climate uh, situation. Uh, also, What's been fantastic development is the um, uh, so-called non-state actors, others than the states who have ratified, have signed and ratified this treaty. Already at the Paris conference, their role was amazing, and I think it's fair to say that without the the, the special role played by the non-state actors, uh, going beyond the standard observer status, 
at that conference definitely contributed to the, to the success. Uh, but we've seen them since that time, and again, uh, coming back to the US uh, after the uh, announcement of President Trump, suddenly an amazing movement uh, that shows that they are behind the Paris Agreement. Uh, uh, Jerry Brown of California leading uh, work in this area, pulling other states in the United States and cities and many others. So the non-state actors are also clearly engaged and moving. And then, of course, we have all these other things happening. The renewable energy revolution. This is fantastic. I mean, pretty soon we're going to have solar uh, roofs uh, on every house and electric cars running on renewable energy and all these fantastic things. And this is just the beginning. Uh, we know that there is just so much more potential uh, that we haven't yet seen. Uh, the challenge that we face is that while all of this is going, most of this is going in the right direction, at the end of the day it's not fast enough and it's not deep enough uh, to reach our objectives. And uh, uh, we need to go faster, we need to go deeper, uh, and while in the long term I think all these good developments will be fine and I'm very optimistic, I am worried about the next few decades of this century, maybe the whole of this century, <laughs> until we sort these things out. Uh, because um, I think, Miles, you know this better than I do. We're at 1.3 degrees now. Global. Come back to yeah, we can come back to that discussion. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's it's close to 1.5, and. Uh, and already there, the impacts are quite substantial and we know that a world of two, three degrees for a few decades for people out there, vulnerable people, whether they live in Florida or on a small island in the Pacific, that could be disastrous. So I am optimistic in the long term, but I'm a little bit pessimistic. But I think on the whole my answer to my first question is yes, we're on a path and I am pretty confident that we will uh, be able to address the climate change problem. Now, let's look at some of the geopolitical issues. And, uh, and I think it's, it's quite important to look at uh, what happened in the US uh, 10 days ago and see what sort of implications it may have. So first of all, let's be very clear that the US hasn't left the Paris Agreement yet. What has happened is a, is a political announcement uh, of an intention to leave the Paris Agreement. And uh, with that, once that takes place, the US joins uh, an illustrious group of two other countries, uh, Nicaragua and Syria, who have not. Uh, signed the Paris Agreement. There are still a few countries that haven't ratified, but they all the others have signed it. Of course, Syria has a few other problems than, than uh, signing a climate agreement right now. Uh, Nicaragua, very interesting to note that they did not sign the agreement because they thought that they did, did not go far enough. <laughs> And, and I remember in the last hours of the Paris conference, supporting the UN Secretary General, negotiating with the head of the Nic Nicaragua delegation, because he was going to object. Uh, and objection, as you know, then you can't have a unanimous agreement. And uh, the Secretary General managed to negotiate with him that he would not object if the Secretary General would go to Nicaragua the week after that and explain to the President uh, of that country. And that's how Nicaragua did not object. But anyway, so that will be the party of three who are not signatory then to the uh, Paris Agreement. One thing that is important to note is that the laws that the, 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 the Paris Agreement stipulates that uh, once it enters into force, uh, no country can, no party can leave it for three years. So that's why it's important that the President Trump's announcement is a political signal now, but in fact it's only after three years that the United States can actually decide to, to leave uh, that agreement and then it will take another year of process to, to actually make that happen, which means that the bottom line is that the actual decision, the final decision, will have to be taken by the next President of the United States, whoever that person will be. Uh, now, in the next years, the U.S. remains as part of that agreement and it will be part of the negotiations and during that time, unfortunately, it will, the U.S. will be able to uh, act in many different ways, but likely in a rather negative way when we see the 
uh, what, what's happening in sort of US climate politics. So that's not very helpful and they can actually be uh, a, a disruptive force in the negotiations for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. It's very unlikely, I would say uh, it's impossible, that the US uh, in the next few years would have the political capital to be able to start a new negotiation or to uh, renegotiate the existing Paris Agreement, as some politicians may have said. So, um, so that's the sort of the, 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 at, the, at the political level. The environmental impacts of the U.S. Uh, leaving the, the Paris Agreement, uh, of course the U.S. is a big emitter, 16% of global emissions in terms of per capita is the, is the largest. So of course things will have an impact, but the, the renewable energy revolution, the, the shift to uh, low carbon energy systems, particularly gas in the U.S., is happening and is going to continue to happen with or without major decisions in Washington, so uh, the actual impact may not be that huge. But what is important is that this is the time when the world should be going faster and uh, in order to reduce, uh, to come to that peaking, global peaking of emissions as soon as possible and it's at that time that the <coughs> emissions in the US may not get reduced as fast as it was originally planned and in fact in a worst case scenario they might even increase. So that's not a good sign. In terms of the geopolitical impacts, for now the world is uh, totally united uh, behind the Paris Agreement and you've seen the, uh, the G7 uh, environment ministers communicate where the US remains in a footnote, uh, separating itself from the other countries. Uh, so for now it's there but uh, it may be because the U.S. is also somewhat isolated on a number of other issues. How long will that last? It's very hard to say. This is a new situation in the world. I remember in the summer of 2015, so uh, a few months before the Paris Agreement, we had a ministerial meeting in Luxembourg to, to plan uh, for the, the final stages of the agreement. And it was at that meeting that the ministers decided that it was better to weaken the text of the agreement but have the United States inside than to make it strong and thereby let the US go out. And that was about the, whether the national climate plans, those famous NDCs, whether they should be part of the legal agreement or they should be outside as an annex. And that was the way the world looked at the US participation at that time. Of course nobody knew that one day when we sign all this then the US would leave. So it, it remains to be seen for how long will the world uh, look at it that way. But for sure what's happening now is that we're heading toward a more multipolar world where uh, the US is not the only leader. Will China take up that uh, leadership role? I think it's hard to say. Leadership is, is very complex. It remains uh, to be seen how that will work. But again, uh, what we're seeing uh, also uh, economic impacts. Uh, the economic impacts will be largely in the US, mostly negative, uh, because the US companies will not get the lucrative markets that others will get now. So overall the impacts uh, at best a slowdown, possibly uh, quite a bit of slowdown. Now in this context, uh, why do we need to talk about geoengineering and why now? Just a few words on that. I mean, already, basically, uh, maybe you, you get a sense of what I'm feeling here. But uh, first of all, when we look at the scenarios for uh, uh, emissions uh, and, and their impacts for the future, if you look at the IPCC scenarios, it's very clear that the majority, in fact, all of them imply that we need to use so-called negative emissions technologies or technologies that remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Uh, to, to get to the two degrees. That was before. Adding the 1.5 degrees is, makes it a little bit more ambitious. Uh, and uh, some even say that uh, the Paris Agreement automatically implies that we need to use geoengineering. I don't think we can say that, uh, but it does uh, uh, challenge us to think how we're going to meet those objectives. Now, we also knew that uh, the climate 
plans that countries brought to Paris, uh, the national climate plans, the NDCs would give us somewhere between 2.7 to 3.5 degrees, which is way higher than what we need to have. And we, but we also knew that the whole idea of the agreement was that every five years, countries would come back with more ambitious plans. But even that 100% implementation is very, very difficult to achieve. It's difficult because of development challenges in every country, north, south, east, west. It's difficult because of the financing challenge, because uh, it costs a lot of money to do this, and it's not all wonderful out there that everything is win-win and it's going to happen. And. Uh, and the geopolitical situation can make that even more difficult. And I think what's, what we've seen and what I try to describe, uh, th that's the kind of geopolitical development that really makes it more difficult uh, to uh, implement those. So the, the idea that there will be 100% implementation, I think that's very optimistic, to say the least. Uh, some people would say that's cuckoo land. <laughs> anyway, that's, um, you see, whatever you want to position yourself. Now, um, so the question that arises is uh, no longer, at least for many, is that no longer that we will go beyond the 1.5 to 2 degrees, but it's more like by how much and for how long. Is it going to be one degree or two degrees? Is it going to be 10 years, 50 years, the rest of the century? Those are the questions. And uh, uh, then, uh, and that's where some scientists say that the only way we can uh, deal with the different risks is to also make use of uh, these new technologies, in addition, of course, to the massive reduction of emissions that we need to do. Now, the problem we have is that these new technologies, the geoengineering technologies, we know very little about them. There has been some research, uh, so the papers have been written. Uh, we also don't know much about the governance requirements of those technologies. So it's very difficult uh, to say that yes, we need them or we don't need them because we just simply uh, don't know enough. And uh, particularly when it comes to the governance requirements, uh, there simply isn't there a comprehensive international framework uh, that could govern uh, those technologies. There are elements. The Convention on Biological Diversity has a decision on, on this issue. Uh, some people refer to that as a de facto moratorium. Uh, it's not a very strong decision, if you can put it that way. The London Convention has addressed the marine geoengineering aspects and uh, many different parts of the existing international law could apply to certain aspects of the problem. But it doesn't hang together and there really isn't any comprehensive framework and that would require quite some time uh, to develop that. So if ever one thinks of uh, the potential use of these technologies, it's not too late to start thinking about those governance requirements. And indeed there are some uh, potential dangers out there because it's quite possible uh, that one single country or a few small countries together uh, they decide that well we've had enough of non-action by the international community or insufficient action by the international community and they decide that they're going to start a program uh, of solar radiation management. And it could even be done by a billionaire, a crazy billionaire or a not so crazy one, just to save the world. And uh, at the moment there is no international law that could be used to, uh, to avoid that. So, uh, uh, and then let's not forget that if one country were to start that and some other country wouldn't like that, you could end up with some other country putting even more greenhouse gases up to make sure that things don't cool down too fast and you have a geoengineering war. So this is clearly not the kind of world that I would like to live in and I would not like certainly my grandson uh, to, to live in that. So uh, we need to do some work. Now, uh, very briefly, I'd like to say a few words about the technologies. I think some of you know more about this than I do, some of you in the room, but I think it's useful to just run through um, uh, the two main types of geoengineering technologies and then some of the governance requirements. And I will not talk that that long, uh, as long as I want, but just another 10, 15, 10 minutes or so. So first of all, uh, geoengineering is, uh, usually we look at it, uh, we define it as uh, large-scale, 
intentional human interaction with nature in order to reduce climate risk. And the key words are large scale, planetary level scale, and intentional. Those two are very important because we have already altered our, for example, our atmosphere with our greenhouse gas emissions, but it was not intentional. The intention was to produce energy uh, and uh, the, the intention was, was not to, to mess up the atmosphere. You could argue, uh, and some have done that, that since 1992, since we, uh, we had agreed on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, since that time any additional emission is in fact intentional. But anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of pushing the discussion, well, let, that, let others uh, deal with that. But in any case, uh, there are two major types of geoengineering technologies that uh, we've been talking about. One is remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Mostly uh, one talks about removing carbon, but there are other greenhouse gases uh, that can be uh, removed. Uh, the IPCC talks about ne NETs, negative emission technologies. Uh, uh, others talk about CDR, carbon dioxide removal, uh, but on the whole uh, we're talking about removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Now some of those, um, they mimic nature. Uh, you can uh, remove carbon by growing trees <laughs> and uh, depending on what you do with the tree once you cut it, you can actually store that in different ways and uh, uh, literally remove carbon from the atmosphere. There are also chemical options, there are options to increase weathering, uh, the speed of weathering, so there, there are lots of different technologies out there. On the whole, they of course uh, are, they help to solve the problem because they remove carbon, so that's good. Uh, they tend to be expensive, uh, at least as expensive as the equivalent mitigation, but often more so, and uh, they take time. It takes time to develop the technology at the scale that is required, and, uh, uh, and then once you've got it at that scale, then you have to s remove the actual carbon. So it, it does take time and you cannot just quickly go and apply it and then expect results very quickly. There are also challenges that come with these technologies. First, environmental, and particularly those that are related to land use or ocean use, there, there, there can be quite substantial environmental impacts, uh, such as uh, especially some of the technologies proposed would, would basically grow trees for production of electricity, but at the same location uh, uh, capture the carbon, and, and there you're talking about massive land use issues uh, of the order of twice the size of India in terms of the, the, the projections. And it doesn't matter what land you use for that purpose, it will have a negative impact on food production and therefore food security and therefore food prices, let alone impacts on biodiversity, water use, pesticide use and so on and so forth. And there are many others. But there are also in important socio-economic impacts because what one is talking about is achievement of a global benefit, reduction of emissions, uh, sorry, a reduction of carbon from the atmosphere, but at the cost of local or regional environmental impacts. How does one deal with that and how do you balance that and how do you perhaps compensate those who receive the negative impacts versus the global benefit of reducing the emissions? So that's just briefly for, for the carbon removal technologies. The other, and perhaps in some ways more interesting, not interesting, is, is the one that is often talked about, uh, is the solar radiation management, and particularly the one uh, that a lot of people talk about is so-called uh, stratospheric aerosol injection. And uh, th th there are many reasons why a lot of people talk about that. One is that they're quite cheap potentially and without getting into dollar amounts but they're, they're clearly orders of magnitude cheaper than anything else in terms of carbon removal technologies and so on and they could act very quickly uh, and uh, that we know that because uh, uh, in a natural volcanic eruption what happens is you get a lot of stuff thrown up into the air including aerosols and we've seen in the case of Mount Pinatubo a few years ago uh, after the eruption, global temperatures went down and they stayed down uh, for about a year, then went up again. 
and th that's the idea of solar uh, of stratospheric aerosol injection but to do it quote unquote properly get the right type of particles get it up to the stratosphere higher much higher than the the, the, the volcano can do it into the atmosphere and uh, reflect sunlight back into space to cool the planet now the problem uh, with uh, this technology is that it doesn't solve the problem it's like putting a band-aid on a on a wound that has an infection in it and and uh, you know it may stop you from something but it doesn't solve the problem uh, it uh, the carbon is still in the atmosphere it will continue to produce problems in the oceans and, and other impacts and it's still there so uh, if you don't reduce the emissions <laughs> and apply solar radiation management then you're kind of condemning the world for uh, doing this uh, forever <laughs> Uh, certainly for decades and possibly hundreds of years and uh, and that is of course a bit of a problem uh, there are also uh, challenges that come with these technologies of course environmental uh, starting now of course we have to be careful we have to compare the environmental impacts of eventually deploying solar radiation management not compared to today's world but to the high climate change world that would have made us decide to go for these technologies but anyway there will be impacts there will be impact on sunlight there will be less sun reaching the the, the earth one to two percent both in terms of quantity and quality there will be impacts on the hydrological cycle and there could be impacts on the ozone layer depending on what kind of material uh, we put into the uh, stratosphere uh, there will also be socioeconomic impacts similar to to carbon removal that uh, we're looking we're getting a global benefit of reducing temperatures but there could be different uh, local and regional impacts and this is particularly interesting the higher you turn the global thermostat that is to say the more temperature you want to reduce it seems that the local and regional impacts increase so uh, it's not only a question of having global benefit and local impacts but how do you decide how to balance the global benefit uh, of reducing the temperatures versus these different negative impacts and um, and this is where uh, and the, the, the termination effect is even more interesting uh, more challenging with solar radiation management because once you start especially if the carbon has not been removed from the atmosphere and the emissions have not been reduced you're basically condemning uh, the world to continued solar radiation management and if you were to stop let's say there is some kind of social upheaval in the world and there is no more consensus to do this kind of uh, uh, technology and the institution that was delivering the, the technology stops then suddenly uh, fairly suddenly the temperatures will go up to where they would have been otherwise and at that point because it happens quickly uh, the, uh, the effects could be catastrophic because uh, uh, plants and ecosystems have difficulty following uh, those changes very quickly so uh, this is uh, these are the two technologies and uh, the, the big issue really especially about this, the solar radiation management is how to govern this. How to make the decisions, uh, to, first of all to start to, to actually do it. How, how do we do that? Uh, can a single country do it? Uh, imagine the perception if one country decides and then the next year there will be a change in the monsoon and if you don't even have to know that it's related to geoengineering the perception that is linked to geoengineering could have very very substantial geopolitical geopolit impact so the, the governance the decision making is absolutely crucial now when we talk about governance we don't just talk about control of course control is very important regulation but governance is also is ab about enabling is, is, is also about it's not just about states but it's also about non-state actors governance can be of course at the level of a national government but it can also be at a subnational state it can also be in a city it can also be in a private sector it can also be a civil society because all of those together uh, will uh, be able to then have an impact so we're talking about different actors uh, but ultimately especially when it comes to solar radiation management we're talking about an intergovernmental agreement there is no other way that one can at least at the in the present world there's no other way I can imagine that there could be an agreement uh, 
to, to do this other than doing it in a, in a full-scale intergovernmental uh, situation such as in the United Nations. But it, it has uh, lots of other elements, governance, it's about access to information, it's about enabling different stakeholders to participate, very much along the lines of the Aarhus uh, Convention. Uh, now, there are also very fundamental ethical issues that arise, and uh, the ethical issues are in particular how do you deal with the transgenerational and the transborder uh, impacts of these technologies. And uh, it seems that the ethical analysis does not help us to make a decision whether or not we should make use of these, but they do help in, in designing the institutions and the governance frameworks that we need to be in place. Uh, so that assessment also has to take place. And then very importantly, the, the moral hazard. How do we deal with that? Will just simply talking about these technologies does not, does that take away from the real energy and emphasis that we should be putting onto mitigation and reducing our emissions? We have to be very careful with that because uh, for some people it looks like it's another solution. When in fact we know that it cannot be another solution, it has, if at all, it has to be some kind of complement to uh, the massive mitigation, massive reduction of emissions that we have to, uh, we have to do. Now, uh, as I said earlier, uh, there are two, well, I mentioned one of them, there are two urgent issues on governance that, uh, we, at least in our work so far, we have found. One is that research is taking place. And research has been taking place uh, certainly on, on the solar radiation side, in the laboratory and in computer models. But now we've come to a stage where uh, concrete announcements have been made to shift into uh, in situ experimentation. That means going into the stratosphere, releasing materials there, and what are the implications of that? How does one govern research? Is there any rule internationally, locally, that would stop from that sort of research from taking place or enable that kind of research to take place within certain boundaries? Uh, that's a big question. How do you govern research? And the second one is what I already mentioned earlier, is that there is a plausible scenario of, of unilateral, unsanctioned uh, announcement of uh, deploying solar radiation management, or even just doing it without announcing it. Uh, incidentally, we don't actually have the monitoring capabilities in the world to actually notice that somebody would start doing that immediately. And uh, that's part of uh, uh, the work that still needs to take place. Now, if, if that sort of deployment of solar radiation management could be so uh, dangerous and significant, does, not, does that not call for a serious moratorium on its deployment? That's a question that we need to, to, uh, to, to, to look at. And if, if not, then how, one, how would one deal with it? If yes, then, then again the question is how would that moratorium look like? What would be in it? How would, uh, because a moratorium is not a rejection, it's a, it's a decision to not do something until certain things are resolved or addressed. How would that look like? Those are some of the key questions that I think uh, we need to deal with. Now, very briefly, a few words about what we're trying to do in our initiative. The Carnegie Council's initiative. <laughs> Um, we have been set up, uh, well, we, we started officially 1st of January this year, and our objective is, is actually to try to make sure that a proper debate takes place at, in the policy uh, scene so that governments can actually come to decisions that they need to take about these technologies. Because right now, what's happening is that the discussions are almost entirely taking place in academic circles, in the research community, in the academic community, and very little in the policy area. And what we're trying to do is to try to shift this and catalyze debate and discussion so that uh, in some years from now, governments will be able to do what they have to do. And what we're trying to do is... Uh, uh, 
somebody's trying to call me. <laughs> uh, the, the way we're trying to do this is, uh, is to, to systematically engage in the next few years with international organizations, intergovernmental and non-governmental, as well as governments directly, civil society, private sector, and work with them so that they either pick up this issue of uh, geoengineering governance in their own work, depending on their mandate, they can do different things, different organizations, or if they have already done so, to accelerate it so that in the next few years we, get, uh, we end up in a situation where different entities of the UN system, uh, non-governmental organizations actually produce a whole series of information products in relation to the governance of geoengineering. But what is important is not the, the, well the information products themselves will be useful, but what is even more important is that behind these uh, reports you will end up with a network of people in those organizations and in the governments dealing with those organizations who begin to understand what is geoengineering and what are the impacts and what governance requirements there are. Because right now the fact of the matter is that there is very little knowledge about these. And so our, our hope is to, to work with these different entities so that in a few years from now uh, the, the, the debate will be ripe and ready for intergovernmental action. Now we're not prejudging what that action should be, that's not our job. It is for societies to make those decisions uh, at the domestic level and at the international level, but we, we, we want to catalyze this so that uh, the, uh, the, the governments at the intergovernmental level will be uh, ready uh, to do this. Now we've, we've started our work, we've engaged with a, quite a few international organizations, UN Environment, World Meteorological Organization, UNESCO, and they are all prepared to do certain things. We've been engaged with some of the civil society organizations, and I, th I think we are reasonably well on the, on the way to, to start this process of engagement, production of uh, uh, materials, and hopefully uh, getting uh, the results. We have a we're hosted by the Carnegie Council. We have a small virtual team working in different parts of the world. Some of them are here, some of my colleagues uh, from different parts of the world. And uh, 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 they, 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 um, uh, we, we work together that way. And uh, uh, I think that's all I want to say about the, 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 our initiative at this point. Uh, just to conclude that um, uh, it's, we are, as, as the title of this uh, presentation was, I think we're heading to a rather risky future. Uh, it's not a question of being optimist or pessimist. Uh, I've, I've personally been always an optimist and I, I still am. But uh, at the same time, I don't think we can, uh, we can get away from the fact that the numbers are not looking very good right now. Uh, in terms of the overall situation. And uh, when it comes to these geoengineering technologies, there are some who say, well, we shouldn't talk about them. It's out there somewhere. Uh, I don't think we can put our heads in the sand and assume that somehow that issue will get resolved. I think uh, it's much better that we look at all the options that we have uh, and, uh, and their governance requirements and try to work that out uh, as much as we can. There are no easy solutions left. If we had done all these things 20 years ago, we wouldn't be here now necessarily. Maybe we would have chosen some good solutions. Uh, now we only have solutions that have different risks and we have to find ways to compare those risks together. Uh, and while we work on each of these technologies separately in their own silos, we have to find a way to bring them together in some kind of overall risk management framework uh, to, so that society at, the, at different levels is able to make the decision on whether or not uh, some of these technologies could be used, and if yes, how. Uh, and, uh, but it's this bringing together in this common risk management framework that I think is really crucial. And I'm looking at Jane Long here, who has written a wonderful article about the New World Symphony. And I, I think it's, it's a wonderful way to look at this, that we need this together, but at the end it has to play some nice music. And uh, thank you, Jane, for that fantastic article. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you.
you an academic. Exactly. So, Janos, thank you very much for that um, overview, and, and also Miles and the Oxford Mountain School. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to to come along. Um, there are lots and lots of things that I could talk about, including Australia's climate policy and why Janos was wrong that the United States has the highest per capita emissions of any developed country, because that title is held by Australia. Unfortunately, um, the Prime Minister of Australia in government stood up uh, just before Trump withdrew from the, um, announced his plan to withdraw from the Paris Agreement and said that Australia was committed to remaining in the Paris Agreement. So that was the good news. And then he said Australia is on track to meet its commitments. And that is an absolute lie because Australian emissions are increasing at present at 1% a year and they're committed to falling by 2020 by 5%. They're currently rising at 1% a year and turning that around will be almost impossible and falling by 26 to 28% by 2030. And the current projections are in fact they'll remain at the same level as they were in 2005. So, but as many parliamentarians know, there is in fact no requirement legally to tell the truth in Parliament. You can't be sued for telling lies in Parliament. So anyhow, I won't go on about that. I am going to try to talk about some North-South issues. And typically North-South issues in climate change focus on the developed world as the major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions historically and the fact that developing countries, which haven't been in the past a major contributor to emissions, suffering the most from those emissions. And that is absolutely the case. And, and many of the issues with reaching international agreements around climate policy are around the issues of developed countries wanting to maintain their emissions while developing countries want to allow, be allowed to increase them and both groups wanting to achieve lower emissions. It's a very tough problem. But I want to talk about geoengineering <coughs> from a different north-south <laughs> perspective. There is still a north-south perspective about developed and developing world, particularly because the impacts of interventions like solar radiation management are likely to have impacts on where the rain is currently heaviest because changing solar radiation directly impacts on rainfall. And where the rain is heaviest is in the lowest latitudes in the tropics and the impacts in all the science studies so far are greatest in the tropics and therefore developing countries are likely to be impacted more by the rainfall changes in terms of monsoon changes. But I'm going to talk about north-south divide between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. There are more people in the northern hemisphere and more countries in the northern hemisphere, so they've got more votes, politically and in terms of impact. But there are some countries that exist in the southern hemisphere but they actually have played relatively little role in thinking about geoengineering. Many of them have focused on climate policies through reducing emissions, mitigation. The other aspect of the science is that because the southern hemisphere has lots of oceans and because it has less population and less industrial activity on average compared to the northern hemisphere. There are unfortunately or fortunately good scientific reasons why some of the geoengineering interventions, including injecting aerosols into the lower atmosphere or artificially fertilizing the oceans might take place in the southern hemisphere as the ideal places to test them by northern hemisphere scientists. <laughs> 
So let's think about that. The southern hemisphere has lots of oceans and because it has relatively less land, it also has relatively less dust, which means that there is in fact a nutrient deficiency in the oceans of the southern hemisphere, more so than in the northern hemisphere, particularly an iron deficit which is an important fertilizer in the oceans. So there have been suggestions, and in fact, some tests of injecting iron into the oceans, and it does work for at least a year or so. It's been tested. But how long it works, and all the tests of course have been done by Northern Hemisphere countries. So it does work, but it won't, it's been demonstrated it doesn't work for very long. The other important aspect is that if you have a relative, sorry, one of the other proposals for fixing the problem through solar radiation management, not only is to inject aerosols into the upper atmosphere, it's to inject aerosols or particles or other pollutants, dust, into the southern hemisphere. So into the lower atmosphere. And it works better in the southern hemisphere because there the air is cleaner. Anyone who's gone to the Southern Hemisphere, the sky is blue much more often than it is grey in the Northern Hemisphere, which is common. So if you want to inject particles, you'll have a greater fractional impact. It works better in cleaner air. If you've already got the particles, acting, adding some more doesn't have as big an impact. So there are two reasons why Northern Hemisphere countries for injecting particles into the lower atmosphere or fertilizing the ocean might do it in the Southern Hemisphere. And in terms of international governance, none of the studies that I have seen have discussed that Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere issue. But there is in fact plenty of experience evidence that Northern Hemisphere countries who want to test something want to do it as far away from their home country as possible. Not in my backyard, please. Particularly with nuclear weapons testing. The United Kingdom tested their nuclear weapons in Aust well, yeah, nuclear weapons in Australia in the 1950s and 1960s and are still unwilling to pay any compensation for the current issues. The United States tested in Pacific Islands, France tested Muroa Atoll. If you're gonna do something and you're gonna get it agreed by your electors, do it as far away from you as possible. And do it in a place where the, um, how would I say, the electors or voters in that other country have relatively little influence on yourself. When we need to come up with governance issues, and it's critically important that we do it for geoengineering, we need to try to come up with a governance which is consensus and copes with individual parties that decide to withdraw from the agreement and go their own way which might be the United States, or it might be some other actor, or it might be some benevolent billionaire who has enough money and hopes to fix the problem. I don't know how we can govern geoengineering at all in a way that is more effective than we govern climate change mitigation. And that hasn't been enormously successful so far as emissions have maybe stabilised but temperature continues to grow. That's probably a good place to finish. Great, well, thank you. Um, whew, what a series of topics. And um, I, I, again, there are so many ways into this. Thank you so much, uh, Yanis, for that fantastic lecture. Um, I'm, I'm standing here with, with multiple hats. Always I have multiple hats. Uh, one is as a, as a lawmaker in, in the UK Parliament. Uh, I recently became an unaffiliated lord. Uh, it's quite a rare species among the, among the lords, um, which means I don't follow any of the party whips. 
and uh, I continue to take an active role in, in, in that chamber, which is quite an odd chamber because it has uh, become a kind of uh, battleground against climate scepticism. Uh, we have uh, the former Chancellor Nigel Lawson there who makes it his mission to disrupt and interject as many sort of uh, doubtful statements as possible to distract us. But, but I think the mood is changing and I think he's now no longer, he doesn't hold the sway he once did. So, so that's a little note of optimism. My other hat is that I um, am, uh, recently became the executive director of the Environmental Defence Fund in Europe. Um, uh, EDF has a long, uh, proud history of a 50-year-old organisation in the US um, and has built itself on really firm foundations based on sound science, economics and law. And uh, it hasn't had a very strong presence in Europe up until now, but uh, there's a decision been made to, for us to, to open an office here, which will add to our capabilities in China, where we've had a presence for 20 years. So, um, so I think EDF's got the potential to be a really interesting global player um, as we grapple with some of these uh, huge uh, global issues. So I thought I'd just say a few words about the Paris Agreement. I, I, I recently I've written an article for Prospect magazine on, on the Trump um, pantomime that took place. Um, and it was a pantomime. Uh, I think it, with Trump, you've got to realize that, it, that the, the attention span is so limited that really he was probably more interested in the choice of music accompanying the statement than he was in the global ramifications of the policy he was announcing. And, and in, in this government, you know, the spectacle is the content. And he was really playing to his base. Um, you know, he, he's now into impeachment territory, so that basically means he's got to hold on to a third of the Senate, and they're just his core supporters, and everyone else really can, you know, is, is, is immaterial. It, so, so it's at one point, at in one level, it was hugely significant that he decided to withdraw, but at another, it was, a, it was just business as usual in the Trump administration, with no thought about the, the sort of wider ramifications of what he was announcing or what the reactions would be because subtlety and complexity are not what they're interested in. And as a little illustration of that, um, it's kind of made, amused me that there was a jazz band playing. I mean, uh, you, you know, you really have to wonder. But, but it was partly this, you know, that this, the spectacle is the content. And, and the, the jazz band was playing Summertime, which if you know the lyrics to that, it would have seemed superficially very attractive. You know, the cotton is uh, high and the fish are leaping and I'm rich and my wife's attractive you know that that's the, that's that's the subtext uh, and liberals just stop your crying um, but that song uh, was uh, from the musical Porgy and Bess and that musical is almost like a kind of metaphor for what Trump's doing because in that musical it's not that lullaby is not a comforting refrain it's actually a fore foretasting of disaster the people in the play lose their lives in a storm which they uh, continually ignore so so the, the light motif of, of that announcement in Paris is that Trump is, is a blundering pantomime president and unwittingly he's, he's actually triggering and using um, things that he knows very little about and there is a reaction and a kind of, uh, and it's actually having a galvanizing effect on many other players. But I think that's where we've got to have hope because, and organisations like the Environmental Defence Fund and other civil society groups in the US are now almost more motivated, more well resourced, more money is pouring in and Governor Jerry Brown has shown that you know, we don't need this very small and quite narrowly focused administration in the White House to, to move things forward and I think that's for me been a kind of unintended and quite positive side effect. Um, I think the other thing to note, just you might have not noticed this, but um, the Environmental Defence Fund actually beat Trump in the Senate. Uh, we got three Republicans to rebel, and we managed to stop them from repealing very important methane regulations. So, you know, he can be stopped, and EDF and others are the organisations who know how to play the system and make that happen. So it's not all doom and gloom. Now, obviously, uh, we were expecting, funnily enough, the day after the Trump announcement, we were expecting a trade deal um, between, well, we were expecting an announcement from the EU and China. And we were all hoping that this would signal, wow, you know, Trump stepped away, but China and the EU are going to step up. And actually, it didn't happen. And now again, you can think, oh, you know, is that already the domino effect of Trump? But actually, what it, what it was, was it that agreement fell apart because of a very complex issue to do with steel and the trade disputes so 
over steel and, and the kind of really hard politics of how do you move forward in a unilateral way to put carbon prices into the steel sector if you're, the bigger question is, is China dumping steel onto the global market and suppressing costs? So it was a very nutty and hard negotiation. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I mean, it would have been great to be able to say the next day, look, China and, you, and the EU have stepped up. But the fact that they disagreed on something quite technical and quite fundamental to solving this problem, we shouldn't just dismiss this as, as neither bloc being able to show leadership. They, they are getting on with the hard task of what does a global response to climate change look like. And so I think, I think we shouldn't be too uh, frustrated that this, this domino effect of Trump kind of cascading out to the rest of the world is going to take root. Since the Trump announcement, we've seen you know, world leaders uh, around, the, around the globe coming forward and saying that it's not up for renegotiation and we're going to double down. And, and God bless the president of Finland who said, hmm, we're going to have to really think about our commitment under Paris. We're going to have to increase it. You know, so, you know, so, so there, are, there is leadership. And in Europe, I think, is, is, is probably where that leadership will emerge and where it's always been, really. I think one of the things to remember is that having a fairly uncooperative US is kind of business as usual, really. We've had that all the way through. And it was really the Obama administration only in the latter part of his second term, which was the anomaly. And that's where the world suddenly had this beautiful alignment of the stars. A new, pres a new uh, president in Canada, Obama taking it seriously, um, Xi Jinping deciding for other reasons he needed to take it seriously, and, and the stars were aligned. It's now gone into a slightly more chaotic situation, and that's what we're more used to. So I, I think again, um, don't don't try not to read too much into the into the into the impact of Trump in the White House. Um, the, the the European approach, however, it does is worth just thinking about and, and why I think leadership here is fundamental and, and also quite tr tricky. And that's because if you look at the political economy of China, the US and Europe, arguably the three blocks who are going to have the biggest impact on this issue. The US has always been pretty good at, at, at a fairly low, light touch regulation and commercialising new technologies and doing so very well. Global, spinning out globally changing industries. I mean, the Silicon Valley has transformed everything about how we uh, interact with technology and they're probably going to carry on doing that into new sectors like transport. If you look at China, they have the benefit of a planned economy plus huge financial resources that they can actually direct towards projects and make them happen. And they're now doing their one belt, one road, um, which is basically taking that and moving it out of China and into the surrounding countries. So they have a planned economy. The US has a, arguably a deregulated and very entrepreneurial economy. Europe, unfortunately, is neither of those things and is sort of stuck in this world of um, neither being particularly good at commercialization, because it, partly because we have a very established industrial complex that is very closely aligned with our political leaders. So you, when you think of Germany, you might think, oh, it's all about people with solar panels on their roofs. It's not really. It's about the coal barons of, 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 the, of the lignite mines plus um, the steel industry and the chemical industry. They're the people who have most sway in Germany. Um, now the Green Party occasionally manages to you know, get its voice heard and, and it uses the public perception of being green to make policies change. But really it's, it's, quite a, it's quite slow to move and it's very conservative in the way it treats its industrial sectors and that's because it's what drives their the engine of the economic growth. So you, so, you in, so you have this, unfortunately, quite established industrial complex, highly capitalised um, sectors, and they're very good at lobbying. So Europe's desire to go forward and its, and its ability to go forward is often tempered by this um, old school kind of often coal-based um, uh, lobby. So the frustration of Europe is that we've got to pass laws. We've got to pass regulations and laws to drive that change in a way that other countries don't need to. So that that's, and that creates a global tension because it doesn't take a very skilled lobbyist to say, oh, but if we pass laws and no one else does, we're going to be disadvantaging ourselves. It's going to be shooting ourselves in the foot. We're going to be we'll have competitive distortions. But, and that, but that really misunderstands the political economy of those two other competing blocks which don't need to pass those laws in the same way that we need to. So we need to educate our lawmakers and get them understanding why it is we pass laws, why laws matter. And, and that's part of what I'm 
I've spent my career doing up until now, trying to make sure that we have legal frameworks that internalise this challenge and force um, those otherwise very conservative economic players in, in our society to move and to lift the, the floor so that we're not just, it's not just the best in the market that get rewarded, but we actually um, move up the regulatory floor so everyone's forced to act. Um, I wanted to, I don't know how much time I've got, but I wanted to just say a quick word about geoengineering. Um, yeah, as I said, EDF is prides itself on being science-led um, and based on um, employing. We have lawyers, we have scientists, we have economists on our payroll and they inform everything that we do. And so, given that, we've also been quite open to discussing issues to do with geoengineering and we've actually funded work where we've helped um, build up some understanding, certainly in the South and the Southern Hemisphere, to getting people ready for this inevitable discussion that's going to come around governance. Now, I don't want to go into the, all the technical details, and, and there's, there are a whole host of technologies that we could class under this topic. But I do think that the Paris Equation, is, the, the, the equation that was written in the Paris Agreement has put this whole topic now much more centre stage. And as I understand it, it was kind of a last minute decision to, to describe the targets in the Paris uh, Agreement the way that it was described. And that was simply to write the equation which is anthropogenic emissions must be cancelled out by anthropogenic removals by the second half of this century so fairly broad target of time to hit but that's that's it that's the Paris equation so that part the anthropogenic removals I think you, you up until that point I don't think anyone would really apart from those very advanced people in the IPCC discussions in policy making circles I don't think that that equation had really been fully understood and that opens up now a much bigger discussion that will be played out I think in ministers briefings in a way that wouldn't have been had Paris been written in a slightly different way. So, that's, so that indicates to me that this is going to be a topic that's going to keep rising up the agenda and governance is clearly going to be needed. But my only, I suppose my, just to perhaps to throw out a kind of controversial thought, is that to the extent that this is going to happen on land or in the sea, I think we've probably got, we know where we're going, we've got conventions that have given us something to build on or we, we've got models of multilateral agreements that we've agreed. But to the extent that this might be happening in, out, you know, in, in the atmosphere above, sort of 500 kilometres above the Earth, that is really wild West. That is just uncharted territory as far as anyone having any government's model that works there. Because you probably all know this, but above, I think it's 100 kilometres, the space is just free for all. There's, no, there's nobody owns it, it's just out there. And if you look what's happened in, in now, sort of the private sector and individuals um, starting to colonise that space and throwing up satellites um, in a fairly unregulated manner, that's, that's, a, that's an area where I think you could see a benevolent billionaire deciding actually if we can send up a network of geosatellites at 500 kilometers range a little bit and keep them stable why can't we do aerosols and just doing it there'd be nothing to stop them so I think that's the challenge is that the, it's, it's complex, everything's complex, but I, I, I don't think you should, I think that, that that really hard part of the global commons, which is beyond our atmosphere, uh, needs to be factored in as, as a feature as we work through these really complicated issues. But just, uh, you know, my final thought is that, um, um, thanks to Martin Rees, Lord Rees, uh, he introduced me to Nikolai Kardashev, who's a 1960s astronomer, who invented a scale to classify um, planetary intelligence, and it's only got three points on the scale, and it's, it's sort of it's basically helped to help us if we do ever make contact with in another another solar system or another planet with intelligence life. How would we measure them? And um, one is being able to exert control over all of the energy that, that um, flows through a planet. We are not yet at one, I think it's fair to say. We haven't got planetary scale governance of our energy balance and if we can do anything in the next, well as long as I'm kind of working and able, I want us to get to one. I want us to have a planetary scale response to this planetary survival question and I think geoengineering and the scientists thinking about these issues are going to help us to get there. So I'm delighted that you're all here and thank you for the invitation.